I'm Mary Beth Gardham from Iowa City, Iowa. Our technical support teammate is Ellen Thomas from the mountains of North Carolina. And tonight I'll be sharing call facilitation with three WOLF members who led the Voting Rights Solidarity Action Committee, Donna, File, Donna Pyle, Chris Morin, and Alanita Muniz, all from the Cape Cod, Massachusetts branch. This Zoom meeting is sponsored by members of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom U.S. Um, section. Uh, this is a public call and uh, uh, and the video recording uh, will be posted in just a few days to Wolf's YouTube channel and our One Wolf Call website. Um, those links are going to be in the chat and on the text pad. WILF is the oldest women's international peace organization in the world, founded in 1915 by Jane Addams of Hull House. There are over 30 WILF branches in the United States, and we're one of 50 sections around the world. You can find out more and join us at our uh, website, www.wilpfus.org slash join. Uh, also going to be in the text pad and uh, in the chat. Mm -hmm. WILF is a sisterhood, so we welcome male, queer, trans members too. These One WILF call collection connections to one another keep us uh, connected uh, and able to coordinate our actions across the country. Uh, we're looking for volunteers to help plan future calls on the One WILF call Zooms. And uh, please contact me at mbgardam at gmail.com to find out more or volunteer. I'll put that into the chat. Please remain muted when you're not speaking uh, to reduce background noise. And we'll post the agenda also in the chat. Uh, the Google Doc text pad um, is available for you to add information, links, resources that uh, people may want to refer back to. And the link to that text pad will also be in the chat. Go ahead and enter your name and location in the chat as well. Why not? That way we'll know you were here. Welcome everyone. My name is Chris Morin and I am from uh, Cape Cod Branch. Last November, uh, Wilp US members um, these calls began planning two solidarity actions for, tw for 2022. One of them was the mass action that we took together on May, June 18th to support the Poor People's Campaign, Moral March on Washington, DC and to the polls. Emily Keel of the Triangle North Carolina branch is with us to give us a brief report on how that went and any follow-up decisions that were made when the update meeting was held on July 5th. So Emily, take it away. Hey, thank you. Everybody hear me okay? Yes. Good. Um, if you missed the live stream of the rally on June 18th, I'm gonna put that in the text pad, the link to that. So please take a look at it. Um, I'll just give a brief review of the weekend events associated with the Poor People's Campaign. In chronological order, on Friday evening on the 17th, there was a communal dinner for people attending the rally and other DC residents. Following that, there was a service at the Lincoln Memorial that was to honor and grieve with others for the loss of a million lives from COVID and the daily losses from the interlocking injustices as poverty and the lack of health care that is ongoing, of course. Those attending were encouraged to write on a wall that was provided the names of those close to them that had been lost. As you can imagine, some people wrote multiple names. It was a time of reflection and grieving. Also on Friday evening, the DC Wilk branch had a kickoff with inspiring speakers and a group of local leaders eager to get the branch off and running. On Saturday morning, most of us went directly to the location of the rally as the campaign had asked us to do that. Not a march, but just show up at the location. We arrived early enough to position ourselves close to the front of those that were standing. The Welp logo flag was visible to people attempting to locate our position. And so most, most members found us 
many of us had on the Wilt PVC t-shirts designed for the occasion and also our buttons. Many people came by to speak and then went back to their group. Some, some of us stayed together through the, through the entire event. It was such a pleasure to meet people um, that I had only seen online. So it was really neat to have people come by and I appreciated that. The rally was close to six hours in length and we were lucky to have wind and not intense heat or sun. There were about 32 of us in D.C. in person, so that was an amazing turnout, I think. And we who were there knew we had the support of those at home. There was a delayed viewing event online with five or six WILP members who had recorded and stopped the viewing to make comments and react with each other. That was a neat way to view it. There was some branch in-person viewing events, and many people just viewed it alone at home. On Sunday, the day after this, there was a Code Pink event um, organized by Code Pink. George Friday, Vicki Elson, Rowan Fairgrove, and Jackie Cabasa attended. It's, it was a coordination of peace groups. And part of the intent of the group was to make a more co cohesive force out of our numerous peace organizations. And part of it is to lobby, to, to plan to lobby the Biden administration for more peace efforts. Several strategy groups were formed at that gathering with interest in particular areas of work that will bring back their recommendations to the larger group. If anyone would like to join this effort, if you let me know, I'll help uh, put you in contact with the person to, to initiate that. The meeting of the National Board was held at Diane Blaze home in Fairfax over the weekend and Diane hosted a luncheon for WELF members in the area on Sunday afternoon. That was a great opportunity for board members to meet in person for the first time in several years and for several of us not on the board to meet and interact. The most important thing to bring to your attention now, however, is the planning for what is ahead. What are WILP's next steps? The seven steps before the midterms suggested by the campaign leadership um, was an important document. And Ellen, did you get that? Are you able to put that on the screen? If, if not, I will put it in the... You can put it on the screen. Well, mm -hmm. I don't want to take time to do that since I don't know how to do it. So I'll put it in the um, Google document thing for later. Um, so seven steps before the midterms are suggested by the campaign leadership. And one uh, is get out the vote solidarity committee's vital work, which is getting the vote out. Dovetails with the most urgent priority of the PPC. So I'm excited that that is a coordinated effort on the part of all of us, I hope. Um, so the people that we need to get to the polls are especially people of color or others who are not consistent voters. Low income people vote about 20 percentage points lower than um, higher income voters. And the main reported reason for not voting is the same as other non-voters, a lack of interest in the issues or a feeling that their vote will not matter. The issues that matter most to low-income people are health and economic well-being. So we should focus on persuading people of the need to vote and what they will achieve for their votes, what, what they'll achieve for their futures by voting. Of the seven steps that you'll see when I put it in the text pad, getting voters out is number one. And then in addition, some branches would like to make unified efforts to demand the White House Poverty Summit with President Biden to have him meet with poor and low wealth people, economists and religious leaders. Reverend Barber, in fact, is asking us to return to DC in September for a direct nonviolent action to further push this agenda. He's hoping to have 5,000 plus people there. So recruiting members of your branch and community to meet that need can be a goal. The campaign expects that partners like WILF and individuals will know what is needed in our own communities. We will not be told what to do by the campaign, but we are asked to just be open to seeing the needs of the poor and low income members of our own communities. Then we should make an effort to look for those who can lead us in our work to support them. We're asked to be committed to help our neighbors and to respond to requests that the Poor People's Campaign may make to push the agenda to lift up those 140 million people that have been forgotten as the rest of us have prospered. So please take this to your ranches and let's figure out what we can do to carry on the work locally. And please share back with me what your branch feels their direction will be and we'll support each other with our own creative ideas, I hope. And if you haven't done so, joining your state Poor People's Campaign 
would be a critical thing to do. And that way you'll be able to follow the leadership of affected people, which is one of the most important ways we can contribute. So I'll put the way to join your state campaign, the link to the rally and the seven steps in the Google document thingy. And thank you for the opportunity. You can put them in the chat also for those who don't have the Google Doc. Good. Thank you so much, Emily. It must have been so amazing to be there. I was at the watch party that uh, Dee Murphy put together with Ellen, and it was great. This is Donna Peel from Cape Cod. It's like Banana Peel, a um, Scandinavian name. Um, the second solidarity action we all agreed on back in November was to, fo was to focus on the work of protecting elections and defending the right to vote. This is work that matters to our democracy and it's very close to our branches hearts. Our subcommittee has been really grateful for the talents and commitment of WELF member Ashley Carrington in assembling and designing a voting right toolkit that all of the members can use right from now through the elections in 2024. I want to point out that she also wrote an outstanding article in the latest piece in Freedom called Supporting from the Shadows, Voting Rights and the Incredible Power of Women by Ashley Carrington. So please read that. So Ashley, could you take it from here and launch this wonderful thing you've created? Hello, can, it, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay. Yes, we can um, hear I you. Want to, I want to first apologize. I was actually rear-ended on the way home. I'm fine, but because uh, there was damage to the vehicle, we had to do the whole police thing. So that threw off my day. So I apologize for not being on camera and being with the actual slide deck presentation. Uh, for the VRT. I'm going to be doing my best to hopefully walk everybody through that um, on my phone. So I'm going to go ahead into Google Drive and see if I can share that with you all. I hope you can hear all of us go moaning and groaning and sending our hearts to you. No, no, it's just, it's been a challenging time, but I think, I think I'm going to get, you know, with all the bad stuff that happens, there's always good things around the corner, right? So we'll see. Are you guys able to see anything that I'm doing on this screen right now? Just your picture. Okay, let's see. Okay. <laughs> Oh, this is so cool. Okay, I didn't think it was going to work. Nice. All right. So once it loads, um, we will actually be able to go through the BRT. So a little bit about, oh, also, thank you, Donna. Sorry, Mary Beth, I'm not following the script. My bad. I'm kind of, you know, this threw me off. I'm all over the place. Y'all work with me. Yeah, it's, um, it's all good. It's all good, but, Ashley. But this is Da, 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 the VRT. And again, my presentation was a lot <laughs> nicer and actually showed you how it actually looks. Um, I've also found a way that we will be able to make the BRT accessible through Linktree so that um, you will be able to put the Linktree or have access to the Linktree instead of having to worry about an actual Google, um, the Google Drive link. And so even though the Google Drive link was placed in the text pad, you can find that under my name. Linktree will be able to you will be able to navigate that a lot easier and you won't have to worry about going in and out of Google Drive. Um, but this is the uh, VRT. And so this is the first page that you will access once you are in the toolkit. And it's essentially just explaining what we're going to be doing and how we will be utilizing this toolkit. And so the resources within the toolkit, they're gonna be utilized to help branches facilitate voting rights activities within their local communities. As we know, there are a lot of local elections happening right now that are very important and significant. We just had um, you know, midterms. We have things that are gonna be going on in the future as well that are very important. And so you can use this toolkit for all of that. 
please keep in mind this is a living toolkit. So what that means is that this document is able to be altered and changed and those things go into effect immediately. So when you utilize this toolkit, you will be asked to save each of these documents to your own device or computer and then edit it with the appropriate information for your particular branch or use. In order to edit these documents, you will be able to do that using Microsoft Word, or Google Docs, Open Office, whatever your preference is for any written documents. And then for any of the graphics, you will be able to utilize the application Canva. Even if you do not have or are not familiar with Canva, it is a very simple application to use because the only edits made to the graphics and flyers will be text. You won't have to worry about changing any graphics or anything. And we ask that you keep the graphics so that as this is a solidarity action, when the VRT is being utilized, that everybody has the same things going across different social media platforms and whatever other way that you use to get out information about your solidarity actions for your particular branch. Ashley? So, yes. Um, I just wanted to say for the people who um, aren't, aren't uh, noticing it, that uh, Emily Levy noted that at the top of the screen, in that green bar across from that, it says view options. And if you click on that and then do zoom ratio, you can, there's a drop down menu that lets you enlarge the screen so we can all see this a little better as Ashley goes along. Mary Beth, since Ashley is on her cell phone doing this, how, maybe it would be helpful if I would share the screen. I pulled it up. You want me to do that, Ashley? I can't see the chat because I'm screen sharing. So if someone is writing in chat. Um, now, would you like me to, to share the screen rather than you? Um, well, I was kind of just gonna, oh, hold on. Am I still in Zoom? Yes. Can you guys still hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, you're in Zoom. It's just, we can't read what's there. And uh, if I pull it up, if I share the screen, then you can tell me to move it down if you want, but people will be able to see it better. Um, okay, I'm actually trying to navigate back to Zoom because I'm still screen sharing. Hold on, more on second, please. Uh, I can um, I can get rid of the sheen, screen sharing. Wait a minute, Ellen. Please. Ellen, what was just suggested worked for me going up for view <laughs> options. Yeah, yeah. and I clicked on thing. that and did the regular size or whatever it said, original size, and I can read it fine. You can. Yeah. Okay. I put mine to 100. It looks perfectly fine to me. All right. Never yeah. Mind. Okay. I'm sorry. Can we keep Go going ahead. since we've got a little bit of, we're a little short on time. Go so ahead. The the VRT is going to include graphics for use on social media promotion for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or any other platforms that you might use for your branches. Language to utilize for letter writing campaigns. There's also additionally postcarding information in there in the resources list um, uh, that we will go over very briefly. Um, text and phone banking and canvassing scripts. So these are things that you can utilize if you don't know what to say or you're not really comfortable uh, talking to people, you know, that's okay. There have been some helpful guides to put uh, for you to be able to have things to utilize with what to say. All you have to do is plug in your branches or whatever election or whatever your event is, plug that pertinent information in. And then suggestions for costuming for I, for I Miss Democracy, which is kind of like a, you know, a funny sat satirical play on, on democracy that can be utilized as a visual aid at parades and voter registrations, you know, 4th of July, anything that's dealing with voting and democracy, you can utilize the uh, I Miss Democracy um, visual aid, I guess. <laughs> um, but this has been created uh, to create solidarity across Wolf US surrounding voting rights and to help mobilize through grassroots efforts to protect our democracy. It should be used as a helpful guide for branches to build their existing work, to join together across the nation, to lift our collective voices and empower our local communities. Again, this is just a guide. We are trying to have everyone utilize portions of the VRT and keep them again as is, only change the information that's relevant to you on it so that we can create this wave of voting rights work that will be sweeping the nation as a collective unit. Um, if you do have questions, I've put my email address up there. Uh, if you need to uh, edit something, but you're not sure how, if you're unfamiliar with how to utilize Canva, um, everything is pretty much click, save, 
change use. <laughs> we tried to make it as easy to navigate as possible. But if you do have those questions, uh, my email is there for you. Um, and you can go ahead and start these actions. We have already partnered with PPC. So there's definitely gonna be information in there surrounding uh, how you can continue to build different um, relationships with other organizations doing voting rights work, maybe that are closer to you as well. Okay, I'm gonna go out of that and go into the resources. And so this resource list um, was compiled by Judy Adams and edited by Mary Beth and one more person. I'm sorry that escapes me right now. But these are going to be materials that you are able to use within your branch. Um, and again, there was some questions about, you know, how... WILF is a 501c4 and like what we're gonna do in terms of making sure things are nonpartisan. And so um, these are the groups that were recommended to utilize that would make sure that that status was not jeopardized. And so um, you'll see that we have election protection, vote forward and vote Latino. Um, and then there's a ton of amazing resources. I'm not gonna go through this because this is available now. So everyone will be able to read through it but there's amazing resources um, talking about what you can do, a little bit of history of voter suppression, um, you know, how this came about, what is actually happening in current, you know, certain areas and how things are being changed and rigged. And then lower at the bottom, you'll see how connecting with the PPC and what they're doing and how to include that information and then a ton of really amazing additional resources that you can use uh, to help with your own voting rights work in your local area. And then again, big shout out to Judy Adams for compiling all of this information. And so all of this is a little bit helpful so that when you are doing your postcarding or letter writing for voting rights, you've got this information right on hand so that you don't have to go searching out for all of those uh, resources. And so if you have, there's also things there like what if I moved the last time I voted, all of these things are going to answer the questions that any of um, the individuals you're trying to contact or might have. And so all of that has been compiled for you so that you have the opportunity to answer those questions quickly and give as much information as possible. So here we go. We're going into the actual uh, files of the VRT. And so the first thing I'll be sharing is the phone banking and text banking uh, scripts. Give that a moment to load. And with, again, with these scripts, the language can be changed and altered to what's more natural for you, but these just provide a help, helpful guideline so that you know what to do and what to say. And so we go through why host a phone or text bank to reach voters, because it's the best way to reach them. You know, it can help prepare people, motivate them to vote, and it's most effective. It's more effective uh, than email. And depending on where you are, it can be more effective than postcard, but we're including all of these assets so that you can have a way to reach people in all forms. So there shouldn't be an excuse that anybody doesn't know how to reach out and do any of these actions because you have multiple methods of communications. Just pick the one that's best for you and your branch and go with that. And so we've listed here some benefits of the text banking and phone banking, and then it gives you briefly some instructions. And again, there's, um, this is a living document, so there'll be, you'll notice a few things that are going to change, such as uh, Elenita is not going to be the point of contact. Again, please reach out to me, Ashley Carrington, um, for any questions that you may have surrounding this. Uh, that will be edited out uh, a little bit later once I get home. Um, but this is going to give you the information about how to make a good phone or text bank, uh, who should you reach out to, how do you use the script and train your bankers, and how to bank. And keep in mind, this is all very loosey-goosey. So it's not like an actual training that you're going to sit down and everybody has to take notes and do this. Just run all of your phone bankers through what time you all plan to start and end your event and make sure that they're familiar with the script enough to have an easy conversation or, you know, they're familiar enough with the text language so that it's not a hassle for them to get the text out quickly. 
And then you have here, if there's a voicemail script, if someone doesn't answer the phone, and then we go into the phone banking and actual text banking uh, script to utilize. And so keep in mind, it's going to feel awkward and that's okay. Not everyone is used to talking on the phone these days. I know for me as a millennial, I make very few phone calls and do mostly text, voice note, or email. Um, so it's okay. You'll be comfortable after you get into the conversation. Also keep in mind, most people aren't going to pick up. So you will likely be leaving that voicemail uh, message that was uh, provided for you at the top here. Um, right here, the voicemail script, you will be utilizing that. Uh, if they do not answer the phone and then, but make sure that you do leave that voicemail information because people still need this information, whether you have that direct contact with them or not, they still need to know about the actions that your branch is taking and about what we're doing. And then please keep in mind that you don't have to stay on the phone with someone who's rude or aggressive. If they get ratchet or crazy, then just cut it off and keep it moving because we're here for people who want to fight for democracy and who are going to be open to the message that we're trying to, to spread. So it's good that when you are doing texting or phone banking, that if you guys are going to be in a physical location to have printouts of all of these so that there's not any questions about what to say and having multiple copies um, is very helpful. And so you have a general conversation outline about, you know, introducing yourself and then the questions that you would ask if you actually get someone on the phone and then how you close it out. And then in this portion, that's really where you make it more customizable to your particular branch. So if you all have some sort of action that you want that your particular um, branch is pushing, this is the time to make sure that you also drop that information in there as well. So not only the solidarity actions that we as Wolf US are trying to push, but as well as your, your local branches. And then in order to track all of this information, this is not provided to you, you will have to set this up. And I would recommend you having one individual who kind of manages um, the, the breakdown of this for your particular branch, but use something such as Excel or Google you know, Sheets or Google Docs to make sure that you keep track of your conversations and keep track of everyone who you've reached out to so that you're not, you know, calling people multiple times and they're getting annoyed and that you can also make sure that you are getting through the list of individuals that you are trying to reach out to effectively. Make sure you note whether they answered the phone or not and make sure that if they have any notes or questions that are important to be followed up on, that you've also recorded those as well. Again, this is just a very bare bones script for how you can interact. And again, if you, when we say the conversation outline, the text is gonna be the same. So instead of being on the phone, you would do all of this through text messaging. And then if you were unable to get a response or you wanted to do just regular text message banking, you would just use the voicemail script as the text banking script. So I hope that um, is clear for everyone in regards to that particular document. Um, and so because we're kind of tight on time, I know I'm getting close to my time here. Um, I'm gonna only share one more thing and then we'll hop into questions. So bear with me again. I'm gonna, you guys aren't gonna see anything for just a second. Okay, and so what I've gone into is now the actual graphics that have been created within the VRT. And so here we have um, a flyer that can be utilized for all social media platforms. And you'll notice that it says refuse to be silenced, exercise we're your right to vote. It. We're not seeing it. Okay, and even though you were not able to see the graphics, uh, this is the explainer for how to utilize them. So each of the graphics has a different theme. There's one for voter registration. There's one uh, that says save the date and you can use that for an election or an upcoming um, event that you're having. There's one uh, that talks about, you know, exercising your right to vote. Uh, so each of the flyers has a different theme and can be utilized for whatever your particular branch is doing at that moment. And so in order to utilize the templates, you're going to save them to your computer first. And you, there's, um, you will see within the VRT that there is a file uh, that says template uh, links. You will just save that link to your computer. And that way you will be able to edit it on your computer and not within the VRT. Because again, it is important to stress, it is a living document. So if anything is edited within the document itself, that is going to change it for everyone who has access to the document. And we're really trying to make sure that does not happen. 
So once you save that to your computer, you'll be able to edit each flyer and add your own branches information, again, using the application Canva. Canva is one of the easier apps to navigate. They do have a lot of preloaded designs as well as helpful tools that will explain to you and videos about how to use the app. So that's why that was chosen because it has the easiest accessibility for everyone. Once you have the file saved to your computer, whomever is going to be printing or editing the document itself, you will then be able to click the template link and then it will take you into Canva. And Canva, the application itself, is what will allow you to add your branches information to the document. You will then save that version of the document and that will be what you utilize from uh, for your solidarity actions. Even if you don't have Canva, you'll still be able to, once it, the file opens, it'll still allow you to edit it in the internet browser and save it to your computer as well. But it is recommended for you to download it. There's a mobile app for both Android and iPhone, as well as an application to be used on computer. And so whatever your operating system is, if you just go to where you download applications for your computer, you would be able to download Canva. And in that way, when you open the link on your computer, it will actually open within the app itself instead of taking you to the website to edit the, uh, the graphic. We are asking that everyone please leave the graphics as they are in terms of what the images are, but please feel free to add or change uh, information as it's relevant to your branch. And it is good to be as detailed as possible. So make sure that you are giving them everything that they're going to need to know in one shot, as well as when you're posting on social media, including that information into your social media posts. Let's say that I'm having a voter registration event. We're going to have a food truck rodeo. Everyone's going to come and register for voting. I need to make sure that I tell them who, what, where, when, and why in the flyer edit, as well as when I post it to Facebook or Instagram so that people do both, because a lot of times they may skip over something in an image. You wanna make sure that you're hitting all of the bullet points for that. Okay, I'm a little bit over time. Sorry about that, uh, Mary Beth, but I wanted to go ahead and pop back in to, how do I close this? There we go. Uh, answer any questions. I know that was very brief. And again, it was not ideal presentation for how I wanted to be able to show you guys what the kit actually looks like. However, I am open for email. Again, the document is going to be made, it's available now essentially through the link, but I'm gonna be creating the link tree and I'll be uh, passing that on to Darian so that she can get that on the website so that everybody will be able to access it there as well. Um, and I'm really excited to have worked with uh, the Voting Rights Committee on this particular project. Um, it's de definitely a labor of love um, and I'm very grateful for all of the input and help that it went into creating it. So um, I wanted to, oh, and I also wanted to add that I am going to be um, adding the piece that I submitted um, that Donna was mentioning to the VRT, uh, just as kind of, I think it's really important for everyone to understand why this is so important for us as women, because we've been doing it for so long. Um, and the fact that we have been doing it for so long <laughs> kind of sucks. <laughs> you know, you would think we would get to a point where let's stop having a conversation about voting rights and let everybody have voting rights. But, you know, um, so I will be including that piece in there. So look for that as an upload a little bit later this evening once I get home. Um, and I want to, again, apologize for it being kind of not as strong as a presentation as previous. Uh, but I thank you guys for your time. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and pass it over again, Mary Beth. I'm so sorry. I'm off script. I'm, I can't see the script in this when I'm using my phone, but thank you all again. I have a question to ask Ashley. Um, and a comment. Can I, can I do a thank you? And then we'll get to questions for sure. Yes. If you want to raise your hand, I'll be happy to do that. Ashley, that's just amazing you. work. Um, this is Elenita Muniz from the Cape Cod branch. And those are some incredible resources for us all to use. I, I am not clear on where we find them. There's a lot of stuff in chat, but I don't know where we find these. So maybe if the actual address of where we find this information could be put in the chat or sent out as a notice to everyone, that would be easier. I can't copy the chat and write at the same time. So, okay, and Judy has her hand up. So if you unmute Judy and then. Hi, thank you, Ashley. Uh, I had a couple of questions about the graphics. Um, are these Creative Commons? 
illustrations by artists um, or do we need to credit the artist who made the materials? And um, that's my graphics question. And in terms of my long document, you said that it was edited by Mary Beth. So I'd like a copy of how it was edited. So I, I'm sure that I have the same thing that's being distributed. That would be great. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Um, so Judy, nothing, it was formatted, I guess would be a yeah. better word, but I don't think that she changed anything that you would have contributed. And the graphics were created by me. And so they don't, no credit needs to be uh, given or anything. We utilize Canva because they use open source material, which means that all of the material that is utilized in terms of pictures are things that are allowed to be utilized. So there's no, you know, copyright or anything like that that would prevent the images from being reproduced in any way. Oh, so th those were your illustrations. That's great. They were the images that were available in Canva and all of those I just put together in the best way that would work for each of the, the uh, deliverables. Okay. Can you spell Canva for us? C-A-N-V-A. Boy, I was way off. Okay, thanks. And the link is in the text pad as well. And after um, I get a moment, like I said, I, it's hard to navigate between multiple screens on my phone. I will go into the text pad and also add the name of the application as well. Great. Thanks. And then uh, Dee Murphy had her hand up. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for being here and able to present this for us. You know, an accident right before that is a very big deal. And I'm glad that you're okay. I'm sure we all are. Thank you for your work. Um, I wanted to make a suggestion as far as when, you know, you talked about um, putting, keeping track of who you spoke with in an Excel sheet. I know that can be a little bit tedious. And so I wanted to suggest um, that people use a platform like Call Hub. Um, we used to use that back when I was in politics and working, you know, with political groups. And it will upload the script for you as you go. So you don't have to remember the script. It also keeps track of who you called, the numbers you've called, and, and it masks your phone number as well. And I uh, wanted everyone to be aware that some states do have restrictions as far as texting goes, and also the hours that you can call and you know whether you're able to call or not. Um, I just have a further question regarding um, what you know what where this can go um are there any wolf-wide events that are are planned that are coming up or is this strictly for the branches to opt into um if they if they so choose or you know where is this being coordinated on a bigger scale thank you so I don't actually know how to answer that. I think it would be, um, at this time, I'm unaware of anything that we're doing wolf-wide in terms of voting rights. I think that would actually be up to the voting rights committee to figure out what, you know, the the things, actions we would like to do wolf-wide and how that could be used. But um, at this time, it is just being used per branch. Um, voting rights committee actually hasn't met. And so hopefully we can meet again and then, you know, get out some ideas for some things we can do wolf wide that we can also implement the VRT to use. Yeah, I don't, I don't know of any, um, any uh, wolf wide events that are scheduled. Um, I, I was hoping that there would be one, but um, I'm not sure that the voting rights committee will meet again. Um, would would one of you care to comment who's who led that committee? I think this is Elanita. Um, I think that um, our vision was that we would put the resources together because everyone's voting particulars are so specific to their area. What what's the issues? When is your voter deadline? Can you do mail in? Blah blah blah. I mean, it's just. There's no way we could do a thing, <clears throat> excuse me, a single thing that would work for the whole country. Um, <clears throat> we had hope there might be some more I Miss Democracy people in the 4th of July parades. I don't know if anybody, Cape Cod was out, but I don't know if other people were out. The information wasn't there. But um, really, I don't think we had a specific date or event in mind. We did come up with a list of several 
possible occasions, Labor Day, et cetera, Hiroshima Day, on which voting rights could be part of the work. But it really is, um, we left it up to each branch to decide how they want to carry it out. <clears throat> and Ashley, did you have a question, comment? Yes, I just wanted to follow up and say it might be good to, you know, speak to the board about having um, one of the committees or a issue committee to work on that because I do think that it would be good for us to like PPC does they like have summer of you know and so there's multiple things that they're doing throughout the summer and it's happening all over the place but it's a big you know campaign that everybody knows about so hopefully we would be able to get to a level to do something like that where we have a committee that's like hey before uh, November elections, we're going to have everybody go to whatever polling place and do X, Y, Z, you know, that sort of thing. I do think that in the future, that would be something that Wilf would really benefit from having, for sure. Well, and because we have, we have this great uh, toolkit and we'll be able to use it right through 2024, maybe there's time to put something like that together. Absolutely. Thank you again, Ashley. <clears throat> Um, there's a couple other questions. Nancy, you have a question? Well, I just would like to suggest that maybe sometime after Labor Day, when the midterms are going to be more full steam, although I'm getting so many messages now for money, um, donations, uh, it might be good to have another gathering to see if people have questions or maybe later in September, if they've been doing any calls, canvassing, uh, gotten, become engaged in anything locally, just to report back, you know, there might be questions to answer or, um, you know, tips or updates that might be something to think about. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Thank you, Nancy. And um, Joan Goddard, do you have a comment question? Yes, I, uh, I think it was either Ashley or anyway, somebody, somebody just mentioned the polling places and someone had mentioned to me this afternoon that the polling places may be a very important place for us to be active because there will probably be some people who are trying to discourage people from voting who will be at the polling places and uh, people may need some uh, encouragement and so on. So that's obviously something that's a long ways from now, but it's something that we probably should start um, including or figuring out how to include at least and that kind of thing. Do you have any comments on that? Anybody else who's in, participated in such activity? Thank you. Um, we've got two comments, Judy Adams and Donna Peel. Hi, I don't know how to make my little hand come up. Yeah, I think that would be great. I used to be a poll worker in our community. Um, and every once in a while, someone would drive up in a car and uh, to get their ballot because they couldn't come in. And I noticed occasionally that uh, sort of spectators would get around that person to help them. And uh, the people inside had to come out and say, uh, we're just handing the ballot, we're not making comments. So it is possible that people can come up. I know uh, there's also been uh, action that you can't give a drink of water to someone who's standing in line for hours. And uh, so, so sort of how we protect the lines and protect the people if there are long lines from uh, being hassled rather than uh, refreshed, um, that that would be a, a great thing. And, and we could, um, it should be a protected uh, activity. And being at the polls protects it. You have to stay where you're supposed to. But I think that would be a wonderful solidarity event for each branch to designate some uh, polling places. I'm hoping that most people are voting by mail these days, but I don't know. Thanks. Thank you. Great comments, Judy. Um, Don is next and then Teresa and um, Cricket also. I just wanted to uh, answer the question. Our group uh, became a working group 
uh, creating this toolkit. We are not a new group that's going to continue on in the future. If some other people want to start a new group devoted to voting, um, you know, that's wonderful. But I, I think that Elanita and Chris and I, at least uh, the Cape Cod people here, um, have thought of this as a short term, uh, creating this kit, getting it out to the branches. And then, you know, if it could be coordinated in a nationwide way, that would be wonderful. But we have other commitments um, that for us individually. I think I speak for all three of us. Thank you. This is so wonderful. Ashley is such a treasure. For sure, for sure. Um, Teresa? Uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to mention uh, that the rules at most polling places are consistent. Uh, you can't campaign within so many feet. So if you're passing out anything, you have to be so many feet away from the polling place. But what's really important is that you could be a poll watcher and you can actually be inside the polling place, making sure that there's no hanky panky going on. I remember in Mississippi once, uh, I was a poll watcher and I watched uh, the older uh, white people take the black women into the booths and mark their ballots for them. And my job was to call uh, the office, the voting rights office and report the activity. Uh, so poll watchers are very legitimate uh, 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 workers and can be inside the polls. When I voted uh, this year in June, I was surprised to see several poll watchers sitting there inside the polling place. So that's something that people should know as uh, rights uh, to, protect, to protect uh, uh, voting and to end any suppression uh, that could take place inside of the polling place. I just wanted to mention that right. Thank you, Teresa. That's very important. You're absolutely right. If we can do that, that would be great. Um, Jane Doyle, you had a question? I think you're muted. I did it. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, one th <clears throat> there was a mention in, um, I think, Ashley, you made the mention, but the idea of um, if a branch or a group of branches are doing any kind of an event that, um, that that could be posted someplace, and I'm not sure, and Ashley, you could answer in a minute or someone could, but it occurred to me that if we don't have a place, um, okay, this is really a question, if there's not something that BRT is having a place where one could go to look for events, um, I don't know if we can put it on our website, but if we become sort of a committee, we might be able to do that. And the reason I bring it up is that First of all, sometimes people will be traveling and might be in a community and like to go to an event, or you may know somebody in that area. And you know, they're, you're in the Cape Cod area and you live in the Cape Cod area, let me tell you, they're having this event and I wanna encourage you to go or whatever. My question is whether we could put it on the website and how that could happen. So I'm really starting this as a question. And Ashley, let me go to you. Did you indicate some place where um, events could be listed? I did not, no. Um, but in terms of where it will be housed, again, um, I'm going to be creating a link tree, which is kind of like a one page web page landing page that will be outside of the Wilf website that will be accessible to just the members and the branches. So like coming out through an eel or, or something like that. Then it will be housed in the resources section of the Wilf US website. So that's how it will be able to be accessible to all the branches once it gets uploaded under that portion. And that just has to be done by the webmaster. So everybody will be able to access it through the Wilf US website. If there are events going on, again, what's gonna... <laughs> 
So I don't want to overstep Mary Beth, but what's going to have to happen is ad hoc's going to have to continue. We're probably going to put out a call for more people who would like to continue this work because there has to be a way for things to be managed. And the only way that's going to happen is through a committee focused on voting rights. So they would be the ones to put anything dealing with those events that are sent to that committee on the website and it'll be tagged, you know, voting rights or whatever. They will be the ones to have to help evolve the voting rights toolkit because as things change, portions of the toolkit will have to be updated and changed. More people will probably give us ideas and resources. So this thing is gonna continue to grow and we have to have people power in order to do that. Cause unfortunately <laughs> your girl can't do it by herself. Okay, <laughs> I'm <laughs> having a lot going on with my life right now. So <laughs> like just with today. So I don't wanna, you know, take on too much and not have it be the best that it can be. But I definitely think we will have to, you know, get some more folks together who've got some time and, you know, be the ones to spearhead the ideas for what we do as solidarity actions coming up and create some of those things for WILF, because right now there isn't a vehicle for that. So what, since, since we have this moment here where people are talking about it and enthusiastic, if you are willing to commit some time to work on uh, voting rights, please put capital V, capital R in the chat with your name. And then we'll know, you know, how to contact you about this, about putting this ad hoc committee back together again and continuing its work over the next two years. I think it is important. It's just a matter of um, uh, increasing our capacity to do that. Um, thanks so much, Ashley. Thanks for the good questions. Uh, Judy, uh, a lot of uh, what you were going to talk about, Ashley covered a little bit. Uh, did you want to uh, take uh, a few minutes to talk about your section? You're on mute. What I want to talk about since the general uh, resource guide was covered is the Center for Common Ground um, phone banking. It's distinct, distinct from the ones that are listed in the uh, VRT in that it is fee free. That is, you don't pay for using uh, the mailing list or the platform. It is BIPOC focused. It was, uh, is, and was founded and led by uh, BIPOC members in the community, Black, Indigenous, people of color. Um, and uh, everything is set up for us, but we are allowed to identify ourselves when we make the call. And these are nonpartisan calls that give out uh, basically information on registration, how you register, where you go to vote, uh, deadlines. And this organization also has what they call uh, democracy centers. And, uh, Here's their definition. This means that this group is really into supporting getting uh, people of color properly registered, voted, nonpartisan information given to them. And the democracy centers are, sent where, are set up in their uh, calling area where more than 55% of eligible voters no longer choose to vote usually. It's a resource that supports ongoing, I'm reading from their website, ongoing year-round civic engagement to achieve meaningful progress on issues of importance in underserved communities of color, where the ill effects of historic systemic racism are deeply entrenched and oppressive. These communities are often rural and identifiable by common characteristics such as high levels of race-based concentrated poverty, lower social mobility, higher rates of environmental pollution and restrictive voter suppression laws. The phrase, my vote doesn't matter, reflects the frustration with the lack of improvement in community pain points, regardless of who is elected. I think that if I've been doing more than a hundred calls uh, from my computer, with their select script, identifying myself as a caller from the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. We don't give a script on what we are, we just give name recognition. 
And then I suggest that, that we look into helping out through their democracy centers. And uh, I'm happy to try to find out ways in which we could do that, constructive ways, not financial support, but constructive ways. The fact that we're not being charged fees for making the calls is quite an advantage. And uh, for branches interested in building diversity, this will really get you going. Um, um, Trudy, I think you did put the link to um, this organization in the chat uh, already, did you? Yes, I did. And I also okay. put it on the text page. So okay, I had great. some summaries of the, the document that I created that you guys summarized and the second one for the Center of Common Ground. So okay. I'd be happy for people to contact me and... Um, Go ahead and put your email in the chat, Judy. Yeah, I think it's already there. You should find it, right. but if not. So anyway, that's a wonderful resource. And this Judy, is if you could put all this in there together right now, uh, that would be helpful so people... Okay, I'll double check. It's in the text pad. I'll check to see. You know, I tried to put it in the in the chat and the file didn't copy, but I'll put my phone number there and I'm going to send it around to the branch listserv and in other ways trying to uh, distribute it liberally. Because I think this is a group that will somewhat painlessly allow us to get into phone banking, get our name recognition and help an organization that's working for uh, communities that the Poor People's Campaign and Wilfers need contacts in. So I'll, while, while we're continuing, I'll try to put some things in the chat. Thanks, Judy. Okay, thank you. Elanita? I have a question about the text pad. Where, what about it, Joan? Um, can you say again or put in the t in the uh, chat? It's been it, it has been put in there several times. I'm and sorry. Okay. Will Ellen will all the way back through it and look for it. And well, see Ellen, it Ellen, Ellen has been putting it in there several times, and I'm okay. sure she will. Thank you. Sorry. Again. That's okay. Okay, um, Joan, can, can your question wait so we can get on to our guest speaker? Would that be okay? I think she just asked okay. her question. Okay, that was it. All right. Um, so we're there are several nonpartisan get out the vote efforts that your branch can support. Wilf has a long history of voter registration effort all the way back to the civil rights era. So you and your members have now worked hard to register voters to get out the vote, maybe doing poll watching and offering rides to the polls. But are you paying attention to what happens after the voting is over? Following the aftermath of the 2020 election, we can no longer take for granted that the counting of votes and determining the winners will go smoothly. Fortunately, our next guest is here to help us understand what we can do about that. Emily Levy is the founder and executive director of scrutineers.org a nonpartisan election protection group that works on making elections transparent so that every voice is heard. This year, they're training people to observe the processing and counting of votes. Emily, welcome. And how can we best prepare for those potentially devastating instances of close elections where extreme partisans try to stop the votes from being counted or even find the votes that don't exist. Thank you so much for that introduction, Elenita, and for, to all of you for having me here and to Nancy Price for inviting me. I'm glad to be here with you all. And also wanted to mention that I'm, I'm thrilled, Judy, to hear you talk about Center for Common Ground. They do fantastic work. Their founder, Andrea Miller, is actually an advisor to Scrutineers, the organization that, that I run. So uh, they're, they're fabulous. Um, so that was a great introduction to, to generally what Scrutineers does. We're kind of unusual in a few ways, one of which is 
that that our home isn't is is online. We have an interactive membership site where members discuss projects with each other and share resources and that sort of thing. So that we're really located in the cloud, not in local communities, but we've got members all around the country. Um, and our expertise within the larger voting rights, election protection, freedom to vote movement is um, in election transparency, security, election administration. We know a lot about the different voting systems in use and what their strengths and vulnerabilities are. And we know that there are a lot of people who want to do something about the current state of our democracy beyond postcarding and calling Congress. Those are the though those are also really important things to do. And so we like to help find projects for individuals that are, that are meaningful and potentially effective using either using skills they already have or helping them develop new skills or some combination. So it's a little bit hard to talk about what we do because there are lots of pieces to it and, and it's somewhat individualized how people get involved. That said, we do have one major project that we're working on this year, which we call the AFTER Project, Act for Trusted Election Results, um, where we're encouraging people to observe in their local election offices or the warehouses or whatever the facility is where votes are being processed and counted. Um, volunteers here are, are not as common as at the polling place. So a lot of folks work to get out the vote, for example, and election night, you might have experienced this yourself, go home, turn on the TV and feel helpless to do anything more. But the truth is that there really is more to do at that point and it's really important. On election night, something that's very important to do where this is possible, and it's not everywhere, is to take images of the poll tapes that are hung outside the polling places on election night. So again, this doesn't happen everywhere, but in most places in the United States, it's required that when the poll workers are closing up um, the polling place at the end of the night, they print out what looks like a cash register tape from the scanners that count the votes, and they hang that so that it's publicly visible from outside the polling place. That poll tape, um, contains the votes for every office and every question on the ballot um, for every candidate for every office. So it's not just how many people voted for Senator, but how many people voted for each of the candidates. And that's as close as we can come to seeing the, the original intent of the voters with the, the voting systems that we're using where we're not counting votes by hand. And so it's really important to record those and compare them later to the announced vote totals. Because if those two numbers don't match, if you're really comparing apples to apples, which you gotta be careful about, if those two numbers don't match, it's the numbers on the poll tapes that are the accurate ones. And so we need to have documentation of what those are. So that's a really simple thing that people in most parts of the country can do. You can go to your own polling place or others in your neighborhood and take either pictures or video of those poll tapes on election night, and um, there are groups that that collect those and compare the numbers with um, with the later results. So that's kind of the beginning of what there is to do after voting ends. And then in the days that follow, up until the time the election is certified, there are all kinds of processes that are happening again at your it's either at your elections office or sometimes it's in a warehouse or other large facility that include things like processing the provisional ballots, deciding which of those are going to be counted. Same thing with the mail-in ballots, um, authenticating the signatures on the envelopes for the mail-in ballots, making sure that, that the chain of custody is kept secure of all the boxes of ballots and the thumb drives that have the vote counts on them and all kinds of materials like that. And then in some places where audits happen, those are also available to be observed. And all of this is really important. I wanna tell you a little story about what a big difference it's possible to make when you are doing this kind of monitoring. In 2016, after the California primary, um, some, some observers went to the Los Angeles County election office and were observing the counting of votes in the primary. Now in California, the Democratic Party allows 
independent voters, those who aren't registered with a party to um, vote in the Democratic primary, but they get special ballots because there's some like Democratic Central Committee, things like that, that they can't vote on. So they get these special ballots called crossover ballots. And the observers noticed that the way those ballots were being processed was ignoring the votes for president. And they stopped the action. They, they pointed out the problem. A supervisor was called in. The supervisor agreed that the, the votes were not being counted properly and insisted that those that, that had already from this batch of ballots that had already been counted be, be recounted so that the votes for president would count and that they changed the process they were using. And as a result of that correction that was made based on the observer's observations, it's estimated that 66,500 votes for president got counted that otherwise wouldn't have. So now that's a rare thing. You probably noticed I'm going back to 2016 to get an example that good of what a difference you can make. It's kind of like playing outfield in a baseball game where most of the time you're just standing around and you might even be bored, but every once in a while you have to take there's an opportunity to take swift and decisive action that really makes a difference. So we need people to be there to do that. And at Scrutineers, we think the, the best people to be there and do that are the people that have already volunteered for, for activities like registering voters and getting out the vote before the election, because they already are interested and um, have shown that they're available to do volunteer work. So in this project, we are trying to reach um, the organizations that already have volunteers like that and train their volunteers to stay after the election and in the, in the week or two that follow, observe the, the processing and counting of votes. So what we have is an introductory training that's about a half an hour long with a half an hour for Q&A that we can bring to any organization that wants to present it to their volunteers to invite them to participate. And then after that introductory training, um, we make available more advanced materials for people that are um, trainings on things like how to observe signature authentication to be able to tell whether it's being done in a biased way or not. Um, how to observe the random selection for an election audit to see if it truly is random, things like that. So we have a bunch of more advanced training that's involved for people who want it. Um, we have one of those trainings coming up next Thursday, and I will put the link in the chat, or anybody who wants to can also find it on our, for those watching the live stream and not seeing the chat, you can find that on our website at scrutineers.org. Um, and then I was also told that many of you um, are always looking for opportunities to get involved from home, whether it's because of um, COVID restrictions, disability, age, et cetera. And I wanna say I've been involved in election protection work as a leader and participant since 2004, and almost every bit of what I've done has been from home. So it's really, it really is possible to do that. Um, other organizations invite you to do things like phone and text banking, like you've already talked about, postcarding, contacting Congress after the election, ballot curing, which is calling people whose signatures didn't match, for example, or to make sure that they um, have an opportunity to, to provide their signature again so that their votes can be counted. In Scrutineers, we have a different set of things that, that we're working on. So opportunities to help in our work, if you're if that if it appeals to you, include things like helping us connect with other organizations. Sometimes our members help set up uh, meetings for us with their legislators, even if they don't feel like they have the expertise. If they're a constituent, it helps get meetings that we can then talk about election security issues with state or federal legislators. Um, there are also things to do to advocate for best practices in your local election. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, you might remember in Florida 2000, the butterfly ballot where people, the, the left and right sides of the ballot were aligned in such a way that you couldn't tell and the holes were in the middle that you were supposed to punch. And people were, tons of people were voting for Pat Buchanan who didn't intend to. 
that's an example of poor ballot design. And before every election in every jurisdiction, the ballots have to go through a design and approval process, something the public very rarely pays attention to. But there's a really good guide put out by the Brennan Center for Justice that outlines really clearly what the best practices are for ballot design. And so it's actually not that hard to look at a ballot design and see if they're using best practices or not. And because so few people from the public participate in that process, one person saying, hey, this is a problem could make the difference in the ballot design in your local office. So that's the kind of thing we encourage people to do where, where one or a few people can actually have an impact. Uh, we also have opportunities for social media work, including building relationships with reporters so that we're actually creating a guide for reporters to understanding the kinds of um, irregularities they might see while covering an election. Because there's some things that look like problems that actually aren't, and some things that don't look like problems that actually are, and most reporters don't know that stuff. So we're creating this guide and we need people to build relationships with reporters through responding to their social media posts so that when the guide is ready, we can get the guide directly to them. So that's, that's another kind of thing that people could do. Um, and no matter what your skills are, there's likely a way that they could be applied to this cause. And it's just kind of personally something I love to help people figure out how to apply what they love to do to this work. Um, whether it's you're an artist and you want to make art and sell it and donate the money, or you want to host a virtual house party, or you love doing data analysis, there's, there's always opportunities. And, and we actually have a few projects now where that we need a few people to do consistently a few minutes a day. Um, I, so I mentioned earlier that, um, I'm sorry, I'm not really able to watch the chat. So I hope that if there's something there that I'm supposed to see, somebody will help me notice it. Um, I, know, I, I mentioned that there are some things that are unusual about scrutineers. And one of those is that a big reason that we exist is to help other organizations amplify their work. And we had somebody come to us, um, you might know the name Susan Greenhall. She's with Free Speech for People and was has been with a few different organizations over the years and is an amazing leader in the election protection space. And she came to us and said, um, there's, there's something that may turn into litigation and I'm not at liberty to talk about it today, but she needs, there's, there's a problem that is being caused by one of the voting machine vendors that um, is illegal and that they need to try to find out how widespread it is around the country. So we're, she asked us if we could do a crowdsource research project and send our volunteers to look into this in their local area, which would take maybe an hour or two once per person um, to help determine how widespread this problem is. So she's, I, that's the kind of thing I'm really excited to do because we have hundreds of members around the country we should be able to get into a lot of places. Um, so she's coming to Scrutineers next Monday to present that project and invite people to be part of it. And um, if you're interested in learning more about it and potentially being part of it, you're welcome to come to that. It is a, it's a, an event that's for members only. And what it involves to become a Scrutineers member is to go to our website and read what, what it means to be a member and what you get as a member and to pay a very steep one-time membership fee of $1.99, which is something that we charge to keep bots off of our site. Because if it were free, we'd have a lot of people, a lot of bots and potentially people coming in to interrupt us, our work. And they seem to stay away because, not because of the $1.99, but because they have to put in a credit card or debit card, which makes them traceable. So, um, that tiny thing seems to be keeping us able to do our, our work in a way online that is not disrupted, at least so far. So we're also going to be having a training coming up on the 31st, which is not just for members. It will, early next week, it will appear on our website, which is um, a training in de-escalation of potentially hostile or even violent situations 
that people might encounter while doing this um, observing after the election. So we've got some special trainers coming in to train people about how to prepare for the possibility that that will happen. Um, so, so that's kind of an overview of what we've got available now and who we are. I'm happy to answer every, any questions. Um, again, I'm thrilled to have you here with us. Hope some of you will come to our training next week and choose to become members of Scrutineers. I'm sorry, I just said, have you here with us. That's what I usually do because I'm usually leading the calls. That was really a mistake. I am happy to be here with you and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you, Emily, so much. It's really important work that your, your, your organization is doing. I wonder if any of our members have quick, quick questions that they might want to ask. We're running a little over on time, but we would want to answer any question. Anybody? Uh, yes. Nancy. And Mary Beth. And Jim. Hi. Nancy, you're first, right? Oh, I'm from, well, I've just been so inspired when I spoke to Emily before, earlier uh, that I'm going to sign up for the after the vote um, observer training and uh, apply myself in a different way to the voting rights and fair elections um, issue. Thanks so much. I'll be happy to see you there and thank you so much. You know, I just realized there's one thing I wanted to say which I forgot, which is I have been an activist since I was in third grade when I organized a petition drive for girls to be allowed to wear pants to school. So that's <laughs> more than 50 years. And for years, I was really unsettled about what issue to work on because I cared about so many issues. But election, every issue we care about is impacted by elections. And so by doing this work, I feel like I'm making a difference not only in preserving democracy, but also in every other social justice issue that matters to me. Thank you, Emily. Um, Mary Beth? Yeah, uh, you were talking about um, uh, preventing, uh, uh, oh, about uh, viewing or photographing the tape of- Poll tapes. Um, yes, right. And I wanted to know, you know, how do you, uh, how do you have the uh, authority to do that? Do people prevent you from doing it or is anyone? Does anyone have the right to say, I'm going to take a picture of this tape? Give me the tape. I want to take a picture of it. They How's that work? hang them in the places where it's required. And occasionally it's required someplace and it doesn't happen. But they actually will hang them either on the outside of the building or inside a window facing out before they leave the polling place at night. The poll workers will do that. They're there for the public and anyone can look and take a picture. Now, I remember when I was a kid, my mom loved to go around the corner to our polling place the morning after the election and they would post the results um, of our precinct. How She wanted to know how our neighbors were voting. And it's, it's kind of like, the next generation of that. Um, mm -hmm. So it's public information. Okay, great, thank you. Cricket? Um, yeah, uh, I live in a community where the person who runs um, our elections is nationally recognized. We have really, really fair elections, which is a wonderful thing to get to say. But I'm wondering, Emily, um, you know, I don't, there's certainly probably things to be done here, but I'm wondering within scrutineers, do you have volunteer needs that would be outside your area that you would do from home or something like that? Yes. A lot of the stuff that I just talked about, pretty much everything I just talked about, except the observing at your local elections office can right. be done from home. And that means you can do it for everywhere. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. George Friday has her hand up. Yes, I, th I think Jones was up first. Yeah, it's just a quick question. Uh, is basically everything that you talked about and probably more on the website? So a lot of us have been making notes and, and so on, but I, in terms of telling other people about the source of information about all this variety of wonderful things that could be done. So the, the stuff about the training for observing after the election is on the website. 
the the training um, about um, de-escalating hostile and violent situations will be on the web on the public website next week. Most of the things that I talked about of the really specifics about how people can get involved is inside our membership site, but not on our public site. Ah, okay, thank you. George? I will be spending that dollar ninety nine. <laughs> Hi, George. A few months back in North Carolina, we had a presentation with our Poor People's Campaign group from um, Center for Common Ground and AMP, the Alliance of Moral Progressives. One of the speakers warned us, or cautioned us, warned is not the right word, but cautioned us to prepare for post-election in some places, a concern about election nullification. Have, do you have any information on that? Do you think it's a real concern that we should prepare for? Because it sounded really scary to me. There is a lot that's scary out there. And I think that's one of those things. And I don't think I, I, I know, George, you and I met years ago at an event before the US Social Forum in Atlanta, the first US Social Forum. I remember talking with you there. And I know from then that there's nothing I know about that that you don't already know. <laughs> like you, you're so connected that I don't, I don't have anything beyond what you would already have on that. Thanks a lot. It's great to see you. Ms. Teresa? Uh, yes, Emily. Uh, I went to the uh, website and put in my card and paid my basic membership and your picture popped up. And then when I tried to get out, uh, it was saying, if you sign out, you'll cancel your thing. Uh, but I think uh, it went through, uh, but I do want, to get out of the uh, app uh, so that my credit card is not just lingering there. Um, um, let me, uh, so I've never heard of that happening. Um, I'm gonna give you my email address in the, in the chat. You absolutely can log out and log back in again. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure why that happened. Go ahead and log out. And if you have trouble getting back in, email me, okay? Well, I should need to get back in because it appeared that my payment took because your picture popped up as if it was a receipt. I didn't know my picture would be on the receipt. So, oh yeah, it said Emily Levy, you popped up. It was really cute. <laughs> okay. Uh, but so anyway, um, all of my information <laughs> is in. Uh, so hopefully I'm a member. It sounds like you are. If, if, if you'll, start, you'll start getting emails from us if you're a member. And if you have any trouble, just shoot me an email, okay? Oh, will do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Emily, so, thank you amazing. so much for taking time during this very busy season to be with us. Thank everyone for your questions. Uh, your work is inspiring, and I hope it will inspire us to engage more in our upcoming elections and even reinvigorate the uh, voter Protection uh, Voting Rights Committee. Uh, truly defending our elections is defending democracy. And we're really grateful that Nancy Price um, invited you to join us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I'm going to have to drop off because I've got another commitment at the bottom of the hour. Thank you all. And you have my email address if you need to reach me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Chris? Just a minute, just a minute. <laughs> yeah, whoa, well, 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 sorry. Okay. Wow, some powerful women on this call. Um, so we've got some uh, important announcements coming up. So um, don't go anywhere. <laughs> These are my script. Be sure to check the text pad from time to time to see any of the notes being placed there. And Ellen is placing that link in the chat again. Um, we want to remind people of the WILP International Congress and Mary Beth is putting that link in the chat for all, uh, for all the information you may need. The dates are um, July 16th and 17th and July 23rd and 24th. 
Um, the agenda is a, uh, consists of formal decision making and workshops, networking, and debate sessions during the week, which would be the 18th through the 22nd. That's a little confusing. Okay. So every three years, Congress brings together members from all over the world to connect and discuss political issues and to share knowledge and best practices through workshops, networking events, and discussion spaces. Usually there are, they are in person this year. Virtual nature means many more people from around the world, uh, all parts of WILP are, are able to come. It's only $15 to register for the whole nine days of Congress. And you can pay $30 for yourself and then choose to pay for another person who is unable to afford that. So WILP US will have representatives at the business meetings. And the workshops appeal to everyone with reports of action, work being done on our issues and collaborations blooming between WILP sections. Okay, Donna. Thanks, Chris. Speaking of international, Nancy Price is presenting a workshop. Nancy, can you tell us about it? Sure. Um, in fact, uh, the several workshops that um, WILF US, uh, the Earth Democracy Committee are sponsoring under our Climate uh, Justice Women in Peace campaign, you can read about on the most recent e-news. So if you go to wilfus.org and the page comes up, you can see in the center column, it says news. And then it says, um, you can scroll down that and it says Earth Democracy Presentations at Wilf International Congress. You can click on see all news. And you also receive the e-news, I believe, uh, yesterday. So you can read the um, titles of the programs that we're presenting, the uh, date and the time and a description. There's one on this coming Monday the 18th of July, and there's one on the uh, 22nd next Friday. Uh, I am giving the one on Monday on the PFAS, Forever Chemicals uh, problem. I'm calling it a, a global health and uh, pandemic and an ecological catastrophe. And I'm hoping to really reach out and engage with members and other sections where they're experiencing issues around PFAS, forever chemicals, but very different from what we're experiencing. Well, to some degree different, but in other ways not, that we're experiencing here in the US. And uh, we're going to, I hope, author a toolkit and uh, have some actions across the uh, sections so that we can really build a movement. Then um, Pat Hines of the Trap Rock Center for Peace and Justice is giving a panel on uh, sanctions. Uh, be sure when you look at the program, when, when you register to see when hers comes up, there's a little bit of um, uh, uncertainty about that. And then the one on next Friday is going to be on um, militarism, uh, climate in the, in impacts from the military, and a, a panel discussion about how sections can uh, work together on building a popular education program to mobilize people to really understand the climate impacts of the military, but also in order to do anything about that, of course, we have to demilitarize, decarbonize, and say no to NATO. So be sure you look at the e-news and be sure that you look at the times and the time zones that you need to calculate when it works for you. I did calculate the time zones, but I, I want to be sure that you check them for yourself as well. So thank you very much and wish us all luck. Good luck I, um, can, I, can I say something to everyone about that? Once you sure. are actually registered on Canopy, um, there's a little clock symbol. Yes. That's in the upper right corner and it automatically converts the time for you to whatever time zone you're in. Yes, so. thank you, Ashley, for mentioning that. I thank you very much. It's, it's yeah. D. Yeah. Excuse I'm not, me. I'm not Ashley, but oh, yeah. you. Sorry. you're welcome. Sorry, thank you very much. <laughs> really appreciate that. 
And a globe symbol converts the language if it happens to be in a different language. They're both in the upper right when you log in. Terrific, thank you. Um, okay, thanks, Nancy. Uh, Ellen Thomas, co-chair of the Disarm Committee, uh, has an announcement too. Go ahead, Ellen. Yes, hi, everybody. It's great to see you all. Um, this Saturday will be the 77th anniversary of the first use of nuclear bombs in Alamogordo, New Mexico. The people living downwind of the Trinity bomb were irradiated yet have never been compensated. Recently, the RECA Act was extended for another two years to compensate the victims of nuclear testing in Nevada and Utah, but not in New Mexico. I have posted links in the text pad and also in the chat where you can learn about what people are doing to change this. We hope you will join the Disarm and Wars Committee meeting. This is really important. Pay attention to this if I'm boring you. Um, on Sunday, July 31st, the last Sunday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time to share what you may have done to remember the Trinity bomb on the 16th. And also very importantly, uh, to share your plans to commemorate the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August. Um, I posted the link in the text pad and in the chat to the Zoom call on July 31st, and we hope that you will come. Um, and also that will work again on the second and last um, Sunday of the, uh, August and every month thereafter, because that's, that's what we use. So feel free to come and join us and, and share what you're doing to help disarm the planet. And before, the, uh, before attending the meeting, I hope you'll watch Hiroshima survivor Hideko Tamura Snyder's uh, 75th anniversary Democracy Now! interview on August the 5th, which has been um, um, connected to the Will Pugh's, uh Disarm, uh, our YouTube channel on the Disarm playlist. And also there is a link to her Zoom uh, talk on August 9th, 2020, that I interviewed her for. And uh, those two links are available there. And then after your events, you can share reports and photos on the Wilp Smart Facebook group, which if you haven't already joined, we hope that you will join and become active in sharing information about what you're doing. And please continue to circulate information about the Wilf U.S. petition supporting the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, both in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. And the links to the two online petitions um, are in the chat and on the text pad. And also, if you go to prop1.org, there's also links to, to that and also to the um, the paper petitions, which if you circulate those and the address to send them to is at the bottom of them. And if you have any questions or comments about any of this, uh, please contact Disarm co-chairs, Cheryl Spencer and myself at disarmchair at wilfus.org. All this information is available in the chat and the text pad. Thank you. Thanks, much. Alan. Thank you. Um, Teresa Alamin attended a no to NATO meeting recently. <laughs> committee and has an announcement from that meeting. Uh, welcome, Teresa. Uh, thank you, Mary Beth. Uh, uh, my announcement uh, is about the No to NATO subcommittee of the Disarm in Wars Committee. Uh, George Friday and I are the co-conveners of that subcommittee. Uh, in addition to George and I, uh, there are five other members of the subcommittee, Nancy in Davis, California, Linda in Irwin, Tennessee, and the Jane Adams branch. Um, Odell uh, in the Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti branch, uh, Pocky in Western Mass, and Robin Lloyd in the Burlington, Vermont branch. So there are seven of us. And we actually had our first 
meeting on July 8th. Uh, and it was a very good meeting. And I will ask George Friday to screen share our 30 month strategic plan, uh, which is to really engage the branches in the international movement to say no to NATO. And as you can see on the far left, uh, uh, George, if you could just uh, read uh, the goals, uh, the goal that we have set up, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. To have events and actions on no NATO, ending NATO, in at least 10 branches by December 2024. And this is kind of the way that George and I work together uh, with a strategic outlook. And uh, you can see the allies and partners and all, and this is a working document. Uh, our next meeting is August 15th and we're rotating around the members so that everybody gets a chance to chair the meetings. Uh, so Nancy Price, is chairing our meeting on August 15th. And because she's gonna be on the east side of the country, uh, we're doing the meeting at 10 a.m., which will be the same time for all of the members of the committee, because we're all in the Eastern time zone on that date, August 15th. And that's the time uh, that Nancy chose uh, for facilitating the meeting. I would like to say that we are planning in October, no to NATO, very big webinar, uh, which will include Tamara Lockrens of Canada, Will, uh, as well as possibly someone from Finland and Sweden uh, to speak on no to NATO. And it will be something similar to the AFRICOM webinar, uh, which George and I organized in December of 2020, uh, that included over 300 people and had over 100 organizations endorsing. Uh, so we encourage others to join our subcommittee uh, of No to NATO, uh, which when we meet at the Disarm, committee meeting on July 31st, uh, George and I are working to get other members of the four branches uh, that we bring to the table. So we feel very confident that we'll meet our goal of having 10 branches uh, doing something over the next 30 months uh, because the Fannie Lou Hamer branch, Metro Atlanta, Triad and Southern Piedmont are branches that George and I work with in addition to the other branches uh, that are represented on the committee. Thank you. Thanks so much, Teresa. Next up, we'll hear from the Cuba Committee uh, and then the Middle East Committee. Uh, Cynthia Roberts, please tell us about the important work that Cuba and the Bolivarian Alliance Committee is doing. Right, um, hello all. Um, we're working with the Saving Lives campaign to get some anesthesia machines that are um, sorely needed in Cuba there. So um, Cindy Domingo kind of scripted something. I'll just kind of like you all were talking, try to <laughs> stick with the script. Uh, but um, oh, and also Mary Beth, um, she sent an attachment, which I know she copied to you and I have no way, I don't know how to screen share. If you're able to, that might be nice. Uh, but if not, no worries. Um, I think people, I, I tried to put it on the text pad and I couldn't make it work, but let me see if I can uh, screen share her email uh, version. Okay, while, you, while, while you talk. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, this 60 year old US blockade against Cuba has caused hardships for the Cuban people in their everyday lives. However, one of the harshest effects of the blockade, especially in this period of the ongoing worldwide pandemic, has been in the area of healthcare, including shortages of medicines, both subscriptions and over-the-counter, plus machines needed to treat and diagnose patients. Last year, the Saving Lives Campaign, a national campaign headed by global health partners that Wilf US was a part of, raised $150,000 to send 6 million syringes to Cuba so that Cuba could vaccinate over 90% of its population, two years, yes, down at two years and older against COVID-19. Thanks, Mary Beth. 
This year, the Saving Lives campaign launched a campaign to help Calixto Garcia Hospital in Havana, a major trauma center. This hospital has 23 operating rooms, but only has two working anesthesia machines. We're trying to raise 125,000 to buy three or four anesthesia machines, uh, which will be used at the cost of about 15,000 each. Also additional surgical supply, surgical supplies, sutures, and variety of things are needed to save lives in Cuba. Contributions are tax deductible and should be made payable either by credit card or by check to Global Health Partners with a note for medical supplies. You can go to um, ghpartners.org slash Cuba 2022 slash, um, and I will put that in the chat. Uh, Cindy also left her address, which I will put in the chat. And just one other note on Cuba, um, something a lot of uh, people working on this and the Bolivarian Alliance get out on the streets July 31st. I had it fresh in my mind because Ellen was talking about usually around noon to have a presence against the blockade. Uh, it's very Simple where we do it here in Indiana, it's a little more contentious in Miami, but I encourage you all to look in your area and see if that's something you might be able to join in. Thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. That sounds like a really <laughs> great project for branches to take on. Um, yeah. Hope you uh, will. So many good ideas tonight. Uh, <laughs> Odile Huguenot Huber uh, has an a announcement from the Middle East Peace and Justice Action Committee. What have you got to report, Odile? Is Odile here? I don't think so. Okay, sometimes she has trouble joining us um, if she's in France and I'm not sure where she is right now. Elanita? You wanna take us out? She left. Uh, Ellen needs uh, uh, she 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 to feed a kid. Uh, okay. All right. So that's about it for this month's One Wolf Call. We don't know if we'll have one in August or not, but we do plan on one in September. It's been a wonderful, wonderful working with Ashley and others to keep our members informed and ready for action this election season, uh, right through to 2024. So do be ready to use that voting rights toolkit. Uh, to protect your elections. If you hang around for the soapbox immediately following this call, you can check in and discuss the call, the Congress and anything else you want to talk about. Special thanks to Donna, Donna Field, uh, Chris Morin, Elena Muniz, and Ashley Carrington, Judy Adams, Nancy Price and special guest, Emily Le Levy. Be sure to hang on for the soapbox segment immediately following the call. And let's all unmute and say good night. 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 Good